Okay, I want to say a very big welcome to you. Today's class is going to be very much strategic, and what we will be talking about is everything as regards your health or health for examination. I want us to look at specific areas where your questions will be juggled out from and gain mastery over them. With this knowledge, you will be able to make distinction. So you need to pay attention and follow through as I'm going on with the explanation. I will be flashing the page numbers and the knowledge is the concept, the sections, and then we'll move on. So when we're rounding up this class, you would know that you are ready for the exam. So permit me to share my, um, my screen with you, okay, right, okay, um, you can give me a signal if you can view my screen, can you? Uh, not, not yet. yet, not yet, okay, yes, you Thank can you. view it, yes, now I can see, you yeah. can see my screen. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let me take off the the video so you will not we will not be distracted by it. I want to stop video. Read. Okay, now this is a screen as you can see. So, like I said, this is all about ethical and responsible sourcing. Ethical and responsible sourcing. And we want to look at the exam in full. It's good we have knowledge of what is expected of us by the examiner. So we would not be taken on our way. So for those that have not uh, yet followed, I think I can't be found on Facebook with this account at N Pekene. You can find me on Facebook and like my page and you will be having tips coming from me daily. You can you get motivational tips, you get tips about businesses, tips about procurement, latest knowledge about procurement and supply. And I have some free videos and lectures on YouTube. So please follow this link and get to subscribe. Almost everything I have done in there are free for now, they are free. So ensure that you are getting the best out of it. Okay, on my page, I have lots of, lots of professionals coming on to share different things. So I would like you to be part of it. Okay, so let's move on. If you can see this page, I have some few books that I want you to, to have. I have the professional negotiator. For you as a procurement professional, you need good negotiation skills and have how to become a project management consultant and make it big. I have the spirit of a soldier. This is a powerful book. All these books are big books. I have the develop the superstructure in you and around you. And then the secret of our success. And these are just few of all my books. Only that this page can only carry this little, that's why I have them in here. Okay, thank you very much. Permit me for that introduction because I believe after this training with you, lots of other students could be coming behind to want to leverage on what both of us are put together. That's why I have it here. Yeah, I hope. Okay. Yeah. So now the first thing that, the first area that we would be looking at should be ratio. And we'll look at page 39 to page 34 ratio analysis to make conclusion on profitability, liquidity, gearing, and investment. And ratio analysis is actually part of the financial due diligence process. You know, we talked about how you would be able to research on the potential supplier to know if they are a perfect fit to your organization before you go on to want to contract them. So when you're doing that, carrying out ratio analysis would hate you in getting the right knowledge about them if they are suitable for your kind of business or the kind of relationship that you're looking at all right 
So racial analysis is actually very, very important. So we should be conversant with racial analysis in four areas. The very first one is the profitability ratio, the liquidity ratio, the gearing and investment. We will come to talk about them. So now we would want to go by the hard basis of CIPS to note that racial analysis would aid us in carrying out due diligence on our potential suppliers and be able to choose the best for our, our buy. So financial ratio analysis has two objectives and I want you to be very, very conversant with them. The first one is for you to be able to track the company performance. When you look at these four ratios, which we talked about, the profitability, the liquidity ratio, the gearing and investment ratio, you can now tell the trend, how far we are there and where they are now. Looking at their history, you should be able to know if they are the right fit for you. That is to track the company performance. Step number two is to compare the supplier's performance against those of other organizations. For instance, if we have the open bidding system, where you feel that lots of lots of organization, lots of suppliers should come and bid. And they start sending in their, their, their tenders in. When you go through the, the financials and you now start looking at this ratio analysis and what is there in, you would be able to know which supplier is doing best as compared with other suppliers. Can you see that? So this is what you must be looking out for because you want the best. Yeah, that is true. Yes. There are certain informations that are required for us to calculate the ratio analysis. And when would you get those informations? There are certain documents you must lay your hands on to be able to find this information. The very first one is a statement of comprehensive income via which some professionals will call the profit and loss statement. And the profit and loss statement is about the summary of the income end and the expenditure incurred over a period of time. So when you look at this document, you would not know how much they have made over time and what have they been using their money for. Number two is the cash flow forecast. And cash flow forecast, it's a place where you can actually tell where the cash of the organization is coming from. And the ways the cash is spent. Then the number three is the statement of the financial position. The statement of financial position tell you in time where they are. We are they as the organization. What are they doing? How good are they financially? Are they doing well? With this, you would be able to say, okay, if we now move on, we can be sure that the resources which they have can aid them in servicing us better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So these are the three things that three uh, three areas you can three documents you can lay your hands on and get knowledge about their ratios, financial ratios. So for the first is the profitability ratio. This ratio helps you to measure the extent to which the organization has traded profitably over a period of time. Talking about profit, how much have they been making? How much have they been making? How much resources have they been generating for shareholders? The profitability ratio tells you this. Why the liquidity ratio helps you to calculate if the organization has sufficient assets to meet liabilities. Do they have stock? Do they have resources that would be able to take care of their liabilities? 
So how do we now find it? We may want to calculate the current ratio. And the current ratio is for us to know the total cost and the current uh, divided by the current liabilities. Yeah. Knowing the current ratio will tell you in time if they have sufficient resources, sufficient assets to be able to service the liabilities which is already knocking on their doors and still being business. So the acid test or the quick ratio can be one way to get this done. And this is sometimes called the liquid capital ratio. Okay. When the questions are coming, it's not going to be this detailed, but you would know. When they place these four items somewhere, you just know, okay, these are the guys that I'm looking for for my answers. So the liquid capital ratio is equal to the total current asset minus the stock. The stock is, another word for the stock is the inventory. When you remove the inventory from the current asset, something would be remaining. And that is to be divided by the current liabilities. And if you still get a positive value greater than one, it means they are doing well. So this brings us to the next one, the gearing ratio. We know we've talked about all this and then we are looking at them again. The gearing ratio is a measurement of how much an organization's long-term funding is presented by the long-term debt or loans in relation to the equity in the business. High gearing means that there is a lot of long-term debt with the company, which may present a risk in the long term. Low gearing suggests that the organization is relying on the equity, that is the capital, and should therefore have less difficulty coping during tough economic times. Can you see that? So the two cash up words are high gearing and low gearing. When we say that the company has a high gearing ratio, it shows that they, are, they have incurred so much debt that may not be able to hate them in doing business in the long term. But the low gearing, it seems that they don't have so much to fund. They don't have so much loans to fund. They, they don't have so much loans. So in a short while, they would be able to take care of it and still be in business. There's one word you're conversant with, which is the return on investment. Return on investment tells you how much the organization has made or where is the organization as regards their invested cost. How do you know the return on investment? You would have to divide the net over the gross. Okay? So when you take a look at an organization that has broken even and have started generating money in, they have paid out their loans, they have, uh, they have realized their invested capital, you know this organization is actually ready to want to do business in a way that they can even offer to give discounts to you, the buyer. In a place where you want them to give you flexible payment strategy, they can do that. Why? Because they are not being driven or pursued by the bank to, to service loans. They're broken even. Yeah. But you know, we talked about certain limitations of using the ratios analysis in analyzing the financial strength of the organization. It has its own limitation. And one of it is that the data used is historical and cannot tell you the financial position in time of the organization. 
It cannot give you accurate and the current result of the organization. Number two is that the current rate of inflation most times are not taken into account. Because when you talk about inflation, the organization may not be doing well now, but the challenge may be peculiar with the economy at that time, not the management's fault, not the supplier's fault. But these ratios can tell you that. Ratios do not also show you the reason for the trends. Those factors that are responsible of changing the markets, those factors that made the supplier not to be able to do well or to do well in certain times, the ratios cannot reflect all that. Number four is that the operational changes are not always considered when comparing performance. Like I said, the economic situation may not be taken into account because ratio analysis does not analyze the economic situation. And always remember that businesses have models of operation where which someone may want to say, call it a strategy. They may have different strategies of operation. So when two organizations are operating with different strategies, you may not be able to compare them appropriately and get good knowledge of their strengths and their weaknesses. Because at the time, a particular organization will say, okay, we're gonna start by giving away. We're gonna start by allowing our buyers to make more and to pay less. So when we have been able to secure their loyalty, we can now introduce price increase. While an organization may start off with premium, where which they want to give less for more money. So how do you compare these two organizations? At the time when one is losing money, one would be making money. The one that may be losing money in time could be you know, preparing to make more money in the future because more customers signifies more money. But this is not absolute, okay? Yeah. Okay, yes. That is yes. number six for you. So number seven, the information from ratio is purely numerical and it's supporting with other data. Money, 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 money does not mean everything. Yes, you've been able to analyze the financial strength of the organization and the organization is not meeting up. It will be appropriate for you to find out about their managerial strength. For you to find out their inclination in that business, in, in, that, in the sector of that industry, which they are operational. So it's good you know other things. Yes, they may not be doing well financially today, but because of this set of people they have in the managerial team, you, you should know that in no distant time, they will come up strong. So that's what we're saying. Numerical, how about the financial ratios? And they cannot tell you everything about the organization. So financial ratios are not very effective as short-term tool. They give a view at a point in time. And number nine, it makes it difficult to make a definitive decision when the ratios make opposition, opposing results. Like some would say, maybe for instance, the gearing ratio is positive, while the returning, return of investment is negative. So you will be imbalanced, you know, looking at which one to follow in time, which one not to follow. So that is about their limitation. This brings us to um okay this aspect has been treated so let me take it off let me take this slide off oh, it has been triggered in the um, okay now let's talk about secondary data i know we we dealt on ways that we'll be able to research and then come up with supporting data for choosing suppliers 
and selecting the best among them. And we talked about two ways. We said the first one is the primary data. The second one is the secondary data. So I'm expecting a question or two from this aspect. So it's good you're conversant with it. Yeah. Yes, okay. It's appropriate. You have knowledge of secondary data. And now what is it? We said in the place where you go on to newsletters, you move into um, websites and I start expunging knowledges from the newsletters and so and so forth. You are mining secondary data because they are not, they are not raw. They are not raw because someone has have gone in there to put them, which you may not be able to get real and reliable data. That's one limitation of them because you are meeting something that has already been refined and redefined. But the primary data, you are the one generating them yourself. Do more work for you, but most times the accuracy is better. I'm coming. Um, I want to be sure that the, the page number which I have there is right for you. Because I know after now, you will be eager to go back and then look at these pages and ensure that we are right where okay, we. So, so sorry, you mean for the secondary data, I have to go to the book? No, no, I'm not, se I'm not sending you there. I'm not sending you there. Um, I'm not sending you there. I'm just telling you that I want to confirm if the page that I've written here is right. And I discovered that is uh, is is supposed to be 50 58 not uh, not uh, 59 you know 16 uh, not 68 i just thought of that so we would have to ensure that we have that edited and and gotten rightly so let's change it to 58 to 60 okay this is beautiful Okay, so for instance, if you want to make reference to this aspect, you need to go to that area and grab your uh, your stuff. So that is about that. And let's rehydrate. I said for you to get the primary data, you can collect them when maybe you can you 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 move into a communication or an interview with someone about a thing that had not yet been published or you network or maybe you commission specific market research or you attend the trade fairs and the exhibition where different organizations will come and talk about their understanding about the industry understanding of the the product which people are in about the government so at that time you are getting things first hand but for the secondary data how do you collect them you collect the secondary data by putting one or two economic indices yeah or you go to suppliers website, you lay on some financial journals and you read about them. And you look at published surveys. And maybe you get knowledge from professional bodies, things that they have published. And you go to some certain websites that are given analysis, that are comparing websites that are dedicated into comparing the profitability or the knowledge of different organizations and get their own analysis. And there is the price published list. 
So you look at all these indices, but what makes it secondary is that you are not the one that initially generated this information. Someone had already placed them. It could be you getting it from organization promoting trades. Okay. So that is that about it. Okay. And remember, I said something which I want to reiterate. I said both the primary and the secondary data can be distorted. Didn't I? And I yes. said the primary data can be distorted in a way that the researcher himself can be biased. And I now went on to say, for instance, you carried out a research in your city, Baghdad, as it is right now. And the result could have negated how people see your people. Would you want to go on by talking about the limitation of your people? You wouldn't want to do that. You would rather ignore certain aspects and talk more on the areas that um, would showcase the beauties of your culture. True or false? True, yes. Yeah. That is why they say primary data can be distorted by the biasness of the researcher. Why secondary data can be distorted by going through more channels before reaching the procurement professional? You know, when information change hands, the potency of that information comes down. Yeah. But, but that does not mean that primary data can work in isolation, no. Secondary data can be used to validate primary data or challenge it. Someone maybe had gone, someone come up with certain results. You may want to quote certain journals and tell them that what you're saying, what you found out is in contrary with what had been published in the industry. Why don't you go back and recheck and see where uh, these disparities are coming from? Yeah. So that is about this. Let's move on to the competitive tendering. Competitive tendering, which we would go to page 106 and then understand through to 107. Are we adding value with this class? Sorry. Yes. Are we are we getting yeah. anything? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now all what I'm saying is your exam questions. I know you like that. We we it's not appropriate for us to go and be reading specific questions which we did not know and be saying that these are the questions. No, it's good you have knowledge of it. So any day, any time, you can, you can be able to give the right answer. Even when a friend is asking you, you can explain them to the person. So it is important that, that you as the procurement professional take an approach that is fair and reasonable when working with current and potential supplier. The first thing you should do is to do what? To avoid discrimination. Secondly, try to treat suppliers equally and respectfully. Adopt a transparent approach to the way you carry out your sourcing. And whatever thing you're doing in this area must be in line with the CEIPS Code of Conduct 2018. So in this area, if you are running a competitive tendering, you are mandated to be open. OK? So why must you carry out competitive tendering? Why should we adopt competitive tendering? Why? 
it could be because of the circumstances at in time, or maybe because of the advantages that you want to get from there. And I said competitive tendering is when you make it open for the bidders, potential suppliers to compete among themselves, to compete in price and to compete in quality. And what we, the procurement professionals, should be watching out for should be the meat, most economical and advantageous tender. Can you see that? So now let's talk about the advantages of adopting competitive tendering. What are the ad advantages? What are the beauties? Why must we? It, it, one is because it's fair and suppliers can be treated equally. You can give suppliers equal attention and the opportunity is to clarify queries. Okay. And it's actually, it reduces the potential for a biased selection of supplier. Because when you have them competing among each other, you are likely to have the best among them, the one that will meet the objective of the tender. And it gives the stakeholder an opportunity to understand the capabilities of multiple suppliers. Yeah. And you can also save time with it. More money can be saved by carrying out one competitive tender rather than inviting suppliers to tender on separate occasions. You save time by opening it up at a time. Let everybody send in their tenders. You see, instead of waiting to be talking to one supplier to the other, you know, you can save time. And when you save time, you save money because time can be translated into money on projects. Tendering actually encourage suppliers to be competitive, to win the contract, which could result in better deal for the buying organization. When suppliers are, are there trying to, to, to take one another down by sampling or showcasing that which they have that is better than that which the other organization is putting forward. What happens? You the buyer, you can, you know, get the best among them all. And there's also a greater likelihood of finding the suitable supplier when you have several of them being invited. Are you good? Did that make sense? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, in all these beauties, if you look at all these advantages alone, you will feel there is no downside of it. Let's go with it. There's no downside. Wow, all these advantages. No, it, it still has certain disadvantages. Okay. This strategy actually prevents quick selection of preferred or current supplier. Because you have to compare them as among each other, you know, it's a huge work. You cannot quickly get things done like pa, 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 pa. No, 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 you can't. You would have to give time, you know, moving from one to another, coming up with selection criteria, comparing them, carrying out your financial ratio analysis of individual suppliers. This is time. Yeah, so competitive temperature is not the option to go by if time is of the essence. And another one, when there's competition, you tend to want to stimulate the wrong behaviors among suppliers, encouraging them to make unachievable low bids 
to attract you selecting them. And at the end of the day, you will incur more costs later. Because they may want to bring their bids down and then, you know, give you some samples of high quality. In reality, they may not be able to meet up. But when you go by contracting them at the end of the day, you will be faced with quality issues, pricing, delivery issues, because they can't give what they do not have. Yeah. It may take more time to carry out the validation and the assessment of multiple tenders than it would for just one, true or false. That's true, yeah. True. Yeah, beautiful. So that is that. Let's move on. Let's move on to page 130 and let's talk about input time. Page 130 to 133. Okay. So we're familiar with the word in quote term. So it is a term that the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, came up with. They actually published a list of commercial rules. And this list of commercial rules are called INCO terms. In most cases, these rules cover the trade via many means of transportation. But though majorly they are on transportation on water. So there are certain advantages of using these INCO terms. Yeah. One is that they can easily take the place of otherwise and lengthy contractual clauses. They can be used to represent certain information when included in contracts, and what are those informations? One, the point at which the goods will be considered to have been delivered. Inco terms can be used to cover that term. Which, number two, which party is responsible for organizing transportation and what form would this take? Three, which party pays the insurance who pays to ensure the goods and which party is responsible for arranging this? Which party is responsible for making duty and tariff arrangements and arranging passage through custom control agencies? So in line with what we are expecting, Let's take a look at sudden inco terms. Okay. But for the sake of your exam, I'm expecting the free FOB, that is the free on board. I'm expecting the D80 delivery at terminal. I'm expecting the DDP, which is the delivery duty paid. But we're not going to look at just this tree let's take it from credo to credo the first one is the x works but in a let's before we talk about x works in a place that you don't have knowledge of them about the definition of these ones you may want to consult with the icc the international chamber of commerce to have the most recent definition of all these terms. So X works, X works is he XW. Here it is written, said the goods are considered delivered at the point of release from the supplier's premises or another name place. This supplier is not responsible for loading or 
transporting the goods and does not have to arrange any export clearance. This must be arranged by the buyer. The risk is on the buyer from this point. That is X works. In a place where you give them cash and they give you the product, it's your, it's, it becomes your monkey. It becomes your, your responsibility, your challenge to move the goods to your, to your property lands, to your country, maybe to your dump site, whatever you want to make use of it. It becomes yours from the point of handover. That is the X works. So you, the buyer, has logistics responsibility. Number two is the FCA, free carrier. The supplier is responsible for placing the goods in the hands of a carrier chosen by the buyer, at which point the buyer takes on the risk. So what are we saying? The free carrier is that you have a logistic company as selected by you, the buyer. Now the seller is not giving you the product, is given the carrier the product. And once the product is handed over to the buyer, sorry, the carrier, what happens? The responsibility is on you. If the carrier fails, you're not gonna hold the supplier responsible. That is what this is saying. Number three is the CPT, the carrier paid to CPT. The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods to a carrier or to an intermediate agreed place. From this point, the buyer is responsible for ensuring these goods reach their named destination. It looks like the free carrier, but there is an appointed place for delivery. It's either they are dropping it there or they are giving it to the carrier at that point. CIP, which is the carriage and insurance paid to. The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods to a carrier or intermediate agreed place and should ensure that the goods have at least minimal insurance cover until this point. Again, the buyer is responsible for ensuring that the goods reach their named destination from here. So let's reiterate, the supplier is responsible for delivering the goods to a carrier or intermediate agreed place and should ensure that the goods have at least minimal insurance covered until this point. You see now, in the place of moving it from their own property land to go and give the carrier out, to go and drop it somewhere for you, they must carry certain insurance. The supplier must include certain insurance, no matter how small that would be. Another one that we are expecting is the DAT. I want you to be conversant and pay attention at the DAT because I'm expecting a question on this. Now let's understand it. DAT is the delivery at terminal. Can you see? Someone is taking something to terminal. Let's see the responsible party. Delivery at terminal. The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods to a named port or destination, such as an airport or warehouse, as well as unloading them at the terminal from the point. Risk passes to the buyer. Okay? Delivery at terminal unloading them. These are your catch-up words. Remember, the supply is responsible what, at delivering a terminal or a name port or a warehouse. Okay. And yeah. they're not going to drive them down there and leave them and walk away. No, when they drive them down there, they are still responsible of the offloading. As they are offloading them, if anything goes wrong, they will have to replace it. Maybe a particular joint is broken as they are dropping them. One gets crashed. They would have to replace it. Yeah, that is that. Now let's take a look at delivery at place, DAP. 
The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods to the buyer's premises, bearing all risk upon until this point. I know you will like this kind of delivery there, which you bring it to your place and you drop it and, you know, and pan, or yours is just to, you know, uh, wrap it, shade it, and that's all. You're not moving anything. Okay. Now, now the supplier has all the risk to bring in your transformer, maybe your generator to your company, and maybe the computer, the printer, the photocopier that you're buying, they only to just transport it. So on the way coming, if anything goes wrong, they are in charge, right? You like that? Would you like that? Sure, yeah. But yeah. There, there is a downside also that I think we should be conversant with. Because most times you pay for this in the, the price or you pay an additional fee to cover this. So when you're choosing a contract of the DAP, you must be, I'm coming, let me check. And ensure that they just hold on. Okay, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Are you here? Hello. Yes. Okay. No, I. Yeah. You, you know. Um. Sorry for the break. Let's continue. No. Yeah. Okay. Confirm if you can see the screen. Yeah, I can see it. Beautiful. So you would have to want to be sure that before you choose the DDP, that is sorry, the DAP delivery at place, you you are not conversant with delivery and that the fee that is being charged for delivery is not so much but in a place where you are good in logistics even better than the supplier would you want the supplier to to make that money you wouldn't want that right i said don't worry that's my terrain i know how to take it to my premise cheaper just give it to me at the point of payment right so so you yeah, only sorry. you only transfer an aspect of the contract to the supplier in a place where you do not have that competency or the expertise. But if you find out that you do not have it and the supplier does not have that, what do you do? You contract the third party to take care of the logistics aspect of it, okay? And rather transfer that fee to the uh, third party logistic company that will be contracted for the transportation of, and the security of that uh, product. So that is about that. Then let's take a look at the DDP. I said, we were looking at three places. We're looking at the DDP as one of your exam question. We're looking at the DAT. We are looking at the free on board as the FOB. So you will have to check them, you know. So now let's see the DDP. So delivery duty paid. The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods to the buyer's premises, including arranging any custom clearances that apply, bearing all risk up until this point. Now, what is the difference between the DAP and the DDP? Here, we have custom clearances being introduced into the description. Okay. Hello. Uh, could you please just repeat it? The difference, I mean? The so difference? Can... No, let me take it back before I talk about the difference. DDP, which is the delivery duty paid. The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods to the buyer's premises, including arranging any customs clearances that apply, bearing all risk up until this point. Any custom clearances that apply becomes a difference between these two. Okay. Yes. Let's see the FAS, the free alongside ship. The supplier is responsible for delivering goods 
to a point alongside a water vessel, such as a dock or quarry, as determined by the buyer at a named port. Once delivered, all risk is transferred to the buyer until the goods are transported and delivered to their named destination. That is the free alongside ship. You see it? You take it to a dock. And sometimes the, in the dock, the ship could be there. But they take it to the dock. They don't place it on the ship. They just, you know, place it on, offload it and place it on the dock. And they go. Moving it from the dock and putting it on the ship becomes the buyer's responsibility. That is the meaning of free, alongside ship, not in the ship, alongside ship. Then the free on board. The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods directly onto the vessel that will transport them to their named destination. As soon as the goods are on the vessel, the risk transfers to the buyer. Is that okay? Yes, it's clear. Okay, this is an examination question. It may come or it may not come, but I'm certain that you would see it. CFRO, cost and freight. The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods directly onto the vessel. Remember, the other, the free on board, it was not placed in the vessel, it was placed on the dock. But now the CFRO is saying that instead of leaving it at the dock, they would have to put it in the vessel. Responsible of what? The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods directly onto the vessel that will transport them to their named destination and must also cover the cost of this. The supplier bears all risk until, until the goods are delivered to the buyer at their named destination. Finally, is the CIF, which is the cost insurance and freight. In the cost insurance and freight, the supplier is responsible for delivering the goods directly onto the vessel that will transport them to their named destination, covering the cost of both the transport and the insurance to cover this. Again, the supplier bears all risk until the goods are delivered to the buyer at their named destination. To understand these things are very simple. What do you do? You look at the pronouncement, look at the name. When you hear carriage and insurance page two, it shows that somebody, so, uh, somebody has received money for carriage and insurance. So the supplier received money for carriage and insurance. So insurance and carriage becomes his responsibility. Cost insurance and freight, as far as they're calling cost insurance and freight, which means money has been paid for cost insurance and freight. So it is the responsibility or the risk would be transferred to the supplier. So when you listen to the words and you pay attention, you will know who has the responsibility or who does not have that. So again, the DDP, the FOB and the DAT, these three things, you must go back, look at them or come to releasing to them and ensure that you have a, everything got in okay and well understood okay okay are you getting something are you getting anything hello hello yes sorry what are, are you getting, are you what? are you getting value from this training sure yeah 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 but uh, sorry but you can go fast faster than this i'm too slow i think uh, i like i already i'll go back to to read it okay i like that because i like that you are the one firing me up okay so let's talk about sustainability okay let's talk about sustainability this is one area that you should be expecting a question or one or two, three or four questions. So sustainability or sustainable development 
It is a development that meets the needs of the population in the present without negatively affecting the resource needs of future population. Okay. And we talked about the CSR, that that's one way that a supplier can give back to the society or the community that he is doing his business. And one way to get that done is to adopt sustainable development. One way to demonstrate a strong uh, commitment to the CSRO, the corporate social responsibility, is to what? Carry out sustainable development. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, with this reading, damage caused to common resources may be irreversible, meaning that the activities that require them may no longer be able to continue. This concept was one of the main influences of the report, Our Common Future, which was published over a century later in 1988, Our Common Future. That is to say that the business owners, the supplier, should look at the future as they carry out today's business. So sustainable developments are those that meet the requirement of the people using them at this point in time, but also taking care of the negative impact on the future generation. That is about sustainable development. Okay. And there are certain sustainability or sustainable development activities in general. And then we use what is called the three main pillars of sustainability to want to explain all these things. Yeah. The first one is the social. And that is how activities affect the people, how activities affect their relationship, how activities affect their culture, how activities affect their laws and political situation. The social, you're looking at the people and their way of life and how your activities would affect them or the activities of the supplier would affect them. So you want to ensure that they are being affected positively. And also moving away from the social of the the social life of the people, looking at the environment. Number three becomes the environment. Our activities affect the ecosystem and the natural resources. Last one is economic. Our activities affect finances or resources of individuals or resources of organization or the market and the national economy. You just want to ensure that what you are doing is not negating their economy. And I told you that there are three words you can use and remember the three pillars of sustainability, S-E-E-E. -E -E. That is C, I say C, S for social, E for um, environmental, the last E for economic. Yeah. Then we moved on to want to talk about the triple bottom line, the triple bottom line, which is the profit people and planet. But let's say in the private sector, success actually depends on profitable and staff in this organization may be challenged rather to save money while also trying to maximize income to the company because they look at money, 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 profit, profit, profit. Not talking about the people and the planet in the private sector. So economic gain becomes the primary driver for such organization. Okay. 
but also in the private sector, a kind of may want to look at um, the, the, the public gain also. And integrating the public gain, that's the CSR into their strategic objectives. Okay, these ones, what do they do? They look at ways where which they can improve social and environmental impact, both inside and outside their organization. And such targets are intangible targets, meaning measuring their success may not be straightforward as compared with the economic profit. And that's why we say one way to incorporate them is to create the triple bottom line. And you may call them the three Ps. And this balancing these three Ps, you would now want the supplier to focus on the economic in a way they, in as much as, in a way to generate financial wealth from the product or service itself. That is one. Also, that is their primary um, objective of going into business. Yes, you will encourage them to do that good. And also you may want them to think about the people. That's the second P. Let them consider the social cultural aspect of the people that are doing business with them, the people that are working for them and the community where which they are working in. Talking about those that are directly affected and those that are indirectly affected. Coming up with ways that they can be preserved, their lives can be preserved and they can make the best use of the circumstances as regards our business. You don't want them to suffer loss, suffer pain and suffer certain things because you want to make money. This is what the second piece supplies. Number three is planet. Here the organization focus on its impact on the environment, which could include the ecosystem. Talking about contam not contaminating the groundwater by dumping out, dumping out waste in the lagoon and around the waterways in the communities and you know, you wouldn't want them to do that. So you come up with these three Ps and use these three Ps to drive them. Okay. When an organization is aware of the benefit of sustainable practice, it may choose to implement some standards that its workforce can follow. It comes up with policies that will aid it in achieving sustainability. So where, which aspect can they implement this? One could be their, through their supply chain. If these practices are integrated into their supply chain, what will happen? Their practices would be sustainable. Yeah. That is true. And that is what ISO 2400, 2017 is talking about. That is the document of International Sustainable Development Standard. And this standard as put out by um, UN, looking at their 17 sustainable development goals, covers this aspect the provision of decent work and the driving of economic growth, reducing inequality in the supply chain, responsible production, supporting communities. Can you see that? This brings fairness. It brings fairness. Okay. And talking about social, let's reiterate, social can be positive or negative. The negative ones or the positive one could be health-related effects about their activities. 
splitting communities. Sometimes when they come in to do businesses like that, they, they tend to want to cause chaos in the communities and the unity of the community would not be together. The people, the love for one another may be tampered. And unsustainable population influxes. People start moving into the community and what the community has may not be able to sustain the influx of people. People coming in, what would happen? Prices will spike. And the owners of the community who once had a bearable habitation may not be able to Okay. Are we back? Hello, I just told you let's talk later. You said okay, and you're calling back. Uh, hello. Hello. Sorry, it went yeah. off. Yes. No, no, it's okay. Uh, you can. Um, I think I can read these things. So. No, no, Maybe don't. You can... you can read them, but let's finish up. Mm, we are almost done, okay? Yeah. Let's finish up. Yeah, I know... but uh, I need to read it. I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, you um... need to. You read, okay? Yeah, right. yeah, I'll read it. Yeah. Okay. So. So that is about that. In reading, you're not going to read everything. I'm just giving you the specific areas. Looking at the page counts, everything. Not everything in those pages that is required of you to note. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Okay. Right, is that clear? So that is, yeah. that is about, that is about that. Now, we, what do we still have? We, do we still have any one left? Let's check. So which one? Okay, we have just two slides. Let's take a look at the bill of lading, okay. page 26. Bill of Lading. Bill of Lading is an examination question that is a document of title stating what is required of those involved carrying, consigning goods until their point of delivery. This is specifically used for cross-border transportation of goods. Yeah, cross-border transportation of goods. That's to say that a border could be somewhere and a good, you're trying to pass your consignment in there. But now this bill of lading is actually going to state all what is required of those involved okay. in carrying the consignment or the consigning goods until their point of delivery. What is required? What are, do they need to carry them? Okay, because you must state it there and what is in there, you must declare it because you don't want certain things to be handled the wrong way and where which something in there would be jeopardized. You don't want to do that. Number two is the letter of credit. The letter of credit is something, is a letter that can be gotten from a bank and this letter would guarantee the buyer, sorry, the buyer's payment to the seller that it will be received on time and for the correct amount. That is, when this letter comes, it's telling the supplier, go ahead and supply it. The money is seated here. Once you deliver, we'll give you the money, there will not be excuses. And you can find this in the, in the um, price spectrum, where we should look at what aspect of the payment strategy that would favor the supplier and which one will favor the buyer. Looking at this one, before a buyer would stand up to go and make a delivery in a place where the buyer is scared to release her money, 
they may want to use letter of credit, which means a bank would have to come in like a third party, receiving the money, keeping the money in a kind of account. And once the product is delivered and it's been found out that it's complete, they now transfer the money to the seller. The buyer would not influence it because certain times some buyers would want you to bring product in country. And once it gets to their organization, they, uh, their country, they know that you have incurred cost in transportation and you wouldn't want to send them back again. And once they receive it, they may want to reopen a new negotiation, telling you certain things. Ah, ah, we, we don't want this big one anymore. Is this, the, can you, we just only need 50% of it. Ah, 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 no, 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 this is not good. We thought it was this and now, oh, no, then I start coming up with strategies of bringing down the price. And you haven't known that taking it back will cost you. You would want to concede to their price. To avoid this, you bring in the bank. So reverse e-auction, we talk about auction. We talk about reverse auction. Now the e-auction is the electronic auction in which the bidding decreases over time until the buyer gets the lowest bid. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, there, I thought there was a page we talked about. A page. Yeah, yeah. We talked about bribery, and that was like, where is that page? I wrote bribery. So, like you know, we talked about bribery. We talked about corruption, and then so you uh, you should be expecting a question or two within this area. When someone gives something of value to other party in order to influence a more desirable outcome from that party, it becomes a bribe. And I told you that it is sometimes difficult for people to tell the difference between bribe and standard practice. What is the difference between bribe and standard practice? It's when the transaction is corrupt that is either to influence somebody to get to do certain things, to induce somebody with outrageous amounts. They may call it different names, facilitation, prize, they may call it certain names, grease and whatever. It's still wrong. And there's what is called cultural relativism. Cultural relativism is when now, People are using the way they do business in their country to want to make you to oblige, telling you that handing money out is not corrupt in their country. What you call corruption in Baghdad is not what they call corruption in another country, in their own country. So they want you to go ahead and ahead to want to do what they want you to do. But you should know that your organization too has certain policies certain global policies about handing money over. There are certain amounts that must not be handed over. There are certain amounts that must not be received from potential supplier by your employees. There are certain amounts that if when given by a supplier, the manager should know. There are certain amounts if when given by a supplier, the senior manager should know. And you know, that's, like you coming up with certain policies for ensuring that there is no bribe. And we talked about different ways or different reasons for receiving bribes. We talked about perceived pressure. Yeah, the person is looking at it as if ah, ah, there's nothing I can do. They are uh, pressuring me that if I do not do it, this and that and that and that. So I don't have an option, I must, I must take it or I must give it, you know, that's like a pressure. That's, that's one of perceived opportunity. Maybe the man could be saying that this is my opportunity to own my own organization. And then I've been working for this organization since without compensation. So I think if I can sell off this aspect of it and all maybe do this and do that, they may want to divert the money into my personal account. That is bad. Number three is the official demand. 
where we, the manager is telling you, oh, just go ahead and do it, no problem. Um, it's approved, it's, uh, you'll pay them the money. And you know, you should know how this, and know when a bribe is a bribe. Yeah. Okay, clear. Okay, so this brings us to three letter words. The end, E N D. Thank you very much. I want to let me stop the the sharing and then stop the recording. Thank you very much. So there are others that we can uh, order exam specific. So everything, 80 to 90% of your questions will be coming out from these areas. So we'll go on and continue with other modules as when needed, okay? 